items instead of appointment of interim zoning administrator, it should say appointment of acting zoning administrator. Okay. With that change, we'll have a second. Second. Who made the motion? Mark. I did. It's Barbara. Hmm? It's Barbara. Okay, did you second it? Yes. 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 Okay, uh, it's hard to hear you. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Mike Bard, did you just join us? I'm on. Okay. There's no consent agenda items. There is. The There's minutes. Two. The minutes of the March okay. 16th and March 30th meetings and a liquor license for the Waterbury American Legion. Bill. Yeah. To those who are on the phone, um, when you're going to speak, if you could identify yourself, please, especially if you're making a motion, your, your voices don't sound all too dissimilar from the speaker. So if you could let us know who you are when you talk would be helpful. We'll try to speak up. Thank you. Okay, Madam, you want to move forward with the, uh, with the uh, agenda, please? The RC public. Public. Any public comment, Chris? I don't think there's any public on. There is. Oh, there is. No, I don't think. <laughs> well, I'm a member. Who are who? Okay. What's your Okay. Do we know how many cases we have within Waterbury right now? The coronavirus. I don't think so. Um. We do not have a number for Waterbury itself, and I believe Washington County have approximately fifteen. I know the number for Washington. I'm curious about the number for Waterbury. the number of cases except what we get from the state's Department of Health. How they are reporting it is, uh, you know, up to them. It's, we, we don't have, we don't have any reporting mechanism or any means to, to count. So we just have to tell you what we know and what, you know, Barb has just told you that. Uh, 
today and uh, residential construction, unless you're doing infrastructure for like a municipality or a city, it's not considered an essential. Uh, my wife did point out, however, there are guys that are still operating uh, residential construction projects. Um, in fact, she told me uh, earlier that at some point we were going to go take a ride and she was going to show me a couple of them. Um, I would suggest that that's up to the state police uh, to handle unless you've got other ideas, Bill. No, we, we don't have a, we have no means in place to enforce this. It's, it's a directive from the governor um, and, you know, we're doing our best to, to uh, shut our facilities down as best as practicable and relying on, the, relying on the public to do the right thing. residential construction may be considered essential, especially if it's a repair, if you have someone who has a roof that's leaking, or mm -hmm. you have someone, you know, water or sewer that needs to be replaced, I think those projects are considered essential. It's something that, you know, for, you know, for livability of a household. Yes. That is correct. Understood. So that makes sense. Just, I have seen Construction of new garages on the residence, and just as sure as you love the ruling was. Probably not an essential service. And potentially subject to a fine. Not by the state police. Yeah. Okay, the questions from the public at this point. Hi, this is Michael Frank. I was wondering, uh, Wednesday will be the uh, school board will be filling the winery vacancy. I know I've spoken to um, most of you at one point or another about this. So I just want to make sure I know the select board had the opportunity to meet the recommendation. The school board did not have to take it. Um, so I just want to make sure for you guys if you have any um, questions for me, even though my position has been well communicated, I think, but I just want to give you the opportunity. Very good. Appreciate that, Mike. Does anybody have any comments here in relation to Mike's uh, efforts to get on the school board? I do have a question for Mike. Um, Who's that? I know I read your email. I think I met you at one point in time. This is Mike Bullard. Oh, uh, can't tell. The thing that I'm most concerned about for any of the uh, proposed candidates is we're all wrestling, and this is even before COVID hit, about containment of costs. You know, because that really affects our, you know, taxes. Um, what's your position? You know, are you looking at, you know, keeping the school tax rate to to a, to a minimum? Or I, I know we all want to see quality education, but in these tight times, you know, we have to mitigate that. What's your opinion on that, Mike? Yeah. So um, I read the letter that you guys wrote. Um, before and I'm um, very much in agreement on this. We need to take a lot of action on reducing our tax burden as much as we can so that we can do what we need to do. Um, that was overall my campaign, <laughs> um, which is basically fiscal responsibility, um, that we can't have um, fewer and fewer students, but yet maintain the same or more staff in the same buildings. I believe that we need to take action, strong action to while maintaining the level of education has um, decreasing costs. But the easiest way to do that is by um, looking at class sizes overall. I'm not saying class sizes of like 70, 35 kids in class. So I'm talking about going more to the state standards so we don't have some schools with six, seven kids in a grade um, or a situation where we have Harlow Middle School which could have between eight and 12, I think closer to 12, 13 kids in a grade class and then cross it that would have like 23, 24 in class. So in other words, you know, long as short, I am four still, we'll see what happens. There's lots of IT now, especially if you're the IT now, and there we'll see you as the school board discusses it. Um, but trying to bring our middle schools together um, and not continue to operate all five elementary schools um, where it makes sense. It's pretty good cross down. But, so I was 
jury had a different opinion. So this is Chris Jones again. Um, now that we're on this topic, I uh, spoke with Teresa Wood there earlier today. Um, people may consider me a little bit radical when I talk about this, but uh, because of this coronavirus, it's brought a kind of a point of mind to the surface about um, changing the way we educate our kids. And um, under the circumstances, we've had to uh, basically pull all our kids out of school. Uh, working parents had have had that haven't been able to have had to go and work from home. A lot of things have changed in our lives because of this pandemic. Um, from what I understand, there's some success in uh, teaching educating our kids from school to a degree, I am going to ask that the school board consider looking at some alternatives moving forward outside of the typical way we educate our kids, the typical way we create budgets, the typical way we teach, and maybe come up with a high end. Mike, you know I bet I've talked to you about it several times. Um, to think that we can continue uh, down this path by consolidating schools, consolidating classrooms, and really make any difference uh, in the long run with our education costs, I think is, you know, <laughs> irresponsible. Um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's a radical idea, um, I think, with some brighter people than me. Uh, looking at this possibility, um, the, the changes that we've been forced to make here just in this short period of time, I'd be curious to know how they've worked out and um, possibly incorporate some of that moving forward uh, for some of different reasons, and I won't get into the weeds of that tonight. So that's just my thought. Yeah, Michael Frank again. I think that, yeah, this is... Um the challenge that we've been going through here has shown that we can, if we come together, we can do a lot of things. Um, so I think it's shown that it's too hard, <laughs> at least in my opinion, it, it's hard or it's difficult is not, um, you know, the, the only argument that can be made for things against things. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things go and then different opportunities um, to look at it, but I think can't keep doing the same thing you're doing. Um, and sometimes the radical idea is, is what leads us down to a path where um, we find a way to do stuff. Exactly. And we're open to new ideas and question things. I am a questioner and I drive people crazy with that <laughs> sometimes. Why? Well, I look at it if we, uh, if we never thought outside the box or decided to do anything different, we'd all still be living in caves. So. Okay, if there's any more questions for Mike. Um, yeah, this is Mark. Um, could you could you just lay out, I have a little bit of difficulty understanding the process. But, so we have a, a board member resign, but they did it after the election, and then what's the process from here? Correct, yeah. So um, the member was James Grace, um, um, resigned, um, and it happened after the election. So the process now is the vacancy gets, as far as I, I'm, from what I've read and gone through, so um, my understanding is um, the school board asks for not for people that are interested in it. Um, they also ask or speak to the chair of the select board, I believe is what it says, um, have a discussion. Um, the select board can recommend someone, um, but the, the school board does not have to take their recommendation. It was part of the I believe that's 46 in the union district. Um, and then the school board on Wednesday will, um, each candidate will be able to speak for up to five minutes, they'll ask questions, and then someone on the board will make a motion to accept one of the candidates and then they'll deliberate and they can go into executive session if they, if they see fit to do so. The vote in the end will be the public where they can debate in executive session. But the, the vote, vote is by the current Wednesday, I do. But the uh, the vote is by the current members, not by the public who attends the meeting. 
Right. <laughs> Correct, yeah, just by the members. And then, um, that part I forgot about, is this only serves until the next town meeting day. Right. I think. So while I believe James has two years, that seat has two years remaining on it, approximately two years, it will be serving on this year, and then um, the seat would be up along with another seat right. um, come town meeting day next year. That's correct. Thank you. Um, and the public does get to weigh in to a little bit if they want in the meeting because before any vote taken by the school board, they allow public comments. Um, so people come on before they vote. And how do we take, uh, this and that fish, how do we take part in that meeting? Or can we take part in that meeting? Hey, you part of the meeting. So you can either um, one of you um, submit a letter only to them, and um, as a recommendation from the select part, there is a recommendation. Um, if not, I will forward to you guys um, the agenda. Um, but you can also get, and there's the information for the Zoom meeting there. Um, HUUSD.org, which is the Harvard Unified Union School District website, there's a um, tab for the board. And then in there, there's in the bottom right, you'll see agendas or packets. You go either way. The board agenda is there. At the top of the board agenda is the instructions to join the meeting. Uh, but I will also email, I'll respond to the email I sent yesterday and uh, put that information in there. Bill, thank you. Two of us wanted to, this is Mark, if, if more than two of us wanted to actually digitally attend that, we would have to. We, we, we would have to um, warn a meeting? No, I don't, I really don't think that you'd have to warn a meeting if more than, if more than two of you uh, ended up on. I think you would, you could be clear that you're just speaking for yourself. Um, uh, it, it would be hard to, to warn a meeting at this point. Sorry, too late. Uh, it's, it's too late to do that. So if there were more than two of you on, well, even if there were only one of you on, uh, unless you're kind of delivering the board's recommendation, which would be voted on tonight, uh, you could only speak for yourself. And so you know the process we go that um, all um, members of the public during the meeting will be in there and muted by the chair. And then when there's public comments period, the chair will allow, will unmute um, so that people can speak. And this is the first time we're going through a Zoom meeting for this, so it could be um, a, a learning experience depending mm -hmm. on how many people are <laughs> attending. And this is, uh, this is Mark again. Um, is there a a number of signatures required and thing to get your name on the list. Uh, do you know how many people you might be going up against on one thing? There's two people. Uh, there is a Mike? Sorry. So, from what I understand from Caitlin, uh, the board chair, is that there are, there are two candidates who have submitted their names. Anyone who's a voter in Waterbury can submit their uh, name for consideration to the board. Um, Mike Frank has done it, and Scott Culver has done it. And Scott sent an email that I believe all the select board got last week, you know, talking about his candidacy.
Uh, just, just a question. Um, does the board desire to make a board recommendation as far as the school director is concerned? Or are you just going to leave it to the school board and your individual comments if you attend the meeting? Yeah, I think it's probably best that you know somebody wants to email the school board chair, you know, uh, in, a, in a written statement, uh, give their opinion, or they can do it at the meeting at this point. Okay. Maybe we could do an email. This is Mike. Maybe we could do an email among the select board folks what our opinions are, and if we have a um, unanimous decision or we come to some sort of consensus that someone presents that, you know, at the Harvard board meeting. You can't, you do, can't that. do that, Mike. You can't, do that. You, can't, you can't have an email meeting. Um, that would violate the public, the open meeting law. Great. You're in the meeting now. If you want to discuss it, this is the time to do it. This is, this is the last time the board is meeting before Wednesday, and you cannot do this by email. Or by even I'm trying to find the email from the other candidate, and I can't think of his last name. Culver. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, Say it one more time. Culver, C U L V E R. Culver. Can maybe we put it out to the end of the meeting and make a decision? Sure. Zoning Administrator, um, we, we sent, I uh, sent out to you on Saturday a policy that was drafted by uh, Joe McLean, our attorney, um, and uh, he felt it was important given the uh, sketchy information we had about when Steve was last actually appointed as Acting Zoning Administrator that it'd be best to do it again. Um, as I told you last week, uh, Dina is uh, going to be laid off. She's, she worked last week. She's working this week from home. Uh, she did issue a couple of zoning permits last week. 
But as, as we go forward through this uh, stay at home and the fact that she's not going to be able to review any of these um, applications or work with the BRB uh, for, for uh, uh, permits that are in the, in the pipeline already, uh, it's important to have an acting zoning administrator. And this policy makes clear that the acting zoning administrator has the full authority to issue permits, uh, make decisions on permits, make decisions that permits are complete, uh, full authority to do this work. So our recommendation is that you would A, adopt this policy that was sent out to you, uh, so it's a policy regarding the duties of the acting zoning, zoning administrator. And then once you adopt that policy, um, then I think would ask you to appoint Steve Lotspeech as the acting zoning administrator. The planning commission met by phone, by conference call this afternoon uh, to appoint Steve as the acting zoning administrator or, or to nominate him to the select board. Uh, they did that this afternoon. So the process is all in place. So we need the policy adopted and then uh, an appointment. Chris, maybe I could just add something. Um, this is all enabled under state statute. And uh, in the past, I've typically been appointed by the select board on a um, temporary basis, if you will. I think, uh, we, as Bill mentioned, we couldn't find documentation of the last appointment. Uh, which may have been more ongoing, but the state statute actually requires that the town put this policy in place just to uh, clarify what the roles and responsibilities are for the acting zoning administrator. So it's, uh, this will put us into conformance with statute. And um, it, uh, the, the other thing that the Planning Commission uh, recommended in their nomination is that um, you would appoint me on an ongoing basis so we don't uh, have, even after the COVID-19 pandemic is over, when um, Dean is on vacation, then I could, um, I could take uh, over as acting zoning administrator. So the idea of the acting zoning administrator is not that we have two people doing the same work at the same time, but uh, this is in the absence or physical absences the way Joe put it in the uh, policy. So uh, when, when Dean is not physically present here, then uh, I would step in. Other circumstances, typically a vacation or you know extended leave for some other reason. Yes, it would be the appointment would be continuous until you rescinded it. Right. Or until I retire. <laughs> yeah, there you go. When but that's a few years now. So has anybody uh, read everybody read through the, the policy and how many questions? Yeah, Bill Bill Steve, this is Mike. Um, statute about when we have to issue DRB decisions, as, as you know, Mike, from being, having been on the DRB, and then um, deadlines on issuing permits. So that will definitely be the, uh, be the priority for me to make sure we meet all those deadlines and uh, keep the ball rolling with any permits that do come in. Things have slowed down a bit, but we still have 
a fair amount of activity. Steve, this is Mike again. I would think that activity would be fairly low considering that, you know, any non-essential construction is kind of really verboten, you know, so I, I would think it would, it would start becoming more of a trickle. I know people probably have things fine, but it, it, it's probably the more long-term kind of things and I don't know. Yeah, what may be under the circumstances, the length of time that it typically takes for, you know, mess permitting, not not to say that the town is necessarily uh, slow at it, but there's a there's a length of time for uh, um, the process to take place, and uh, what better time to put in a permit for something down the road than uh, during the during. Understood. Yeah, we're not sure how it's going to play out, but I'm sure as people see the light at the end of the tunnel, they'll be, uh, you know, anxious to get permits in place as well. So we'll, we'll see. We, we have the capacity to be flexible, and we're, we've worked out a system here where I can work from home most of the time and then be in the office when things need to be mailed and coordinate with Carla. Yeah, it's Chris again. I'm sure some of the people are going to want to get the ground running. So, um, well, if there's no other questions about the policy itself, somebody can make a motion to uh, adopt the policy as written uh, for the acting zoning administrator. I make a motion to, this is Mike, to approve um, Steve Lodgebis as being the acting zoning administrator. No, you got to make well, a motion. to adopt the policy first, Mike, and then appoint uh, Steve. So I make a motion to approve the... Uh, policy on uh, zoning administrators. Well, it would be the yeah policy regarding acting zoning administrator. It's specific to that position. I got it. Right. Got it. Carl's I got it. it. We're all set. Good. Is there a second? This is Mark. I'll second. Okay. If there's any more questions or comments, we got any other items we should approve, please say aye. 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 No, just, just the, appoint him as the acting zoning administrator, and it goes on until you say he's not. I make a motion we uh, appoint Steve Lodgepeak as the zoning administrator. Acting. Acting as the zoning administrator. Acting zoning administrator. It's okay, I got it. Thank you. Who's the second? Mike. Mike. Thank you. Do I have comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for your work, Steve. Oh, thank you.
talk about it yet. Okay. <laughs> we haven't talked about it yet. Right. So, um, excuse us, we'll just wait until we get to you, okay? Sure. Thanks. So, Chris, um, Katie asked for this to be on the agenda, so maybe we should allow Katie to speak first. Barb Farr is also still on the phone to be able to report what's been going on in the, uh, the weekly telephone calls that, you know, this is, a, this is a subject that has been discussed there as well. So why don't we let Katie go first, Chris? initially surprised and concerned that I hadn't heard that our newspaper outlet would be ending. Um, so I was kind of worried about that, so I started the discussion on Front Porch Forum about it to see if other people were feeling the same way. And quite a few of them were. Some of them reached out to me by email um, expressing their concern and their support to start up a new newspaper if that was something, or to reach out to uh, Tom Kearney himself and talk about what are some possible ways we can help out the paper, whether it's people buying yearly subscriptions or having a cost associated with it if you buy it at a local store, however you want. Um, so there's been talk about that, there's been talk about people um, starting up a weekly newsletter that's just online. And I've had some contact with Gordon Miller, and he's been talking with some people as well to start up something that um, can be newsworthy and go community-wide. Um, I'll let Lisa talk in a second, but I was in contact with her, and she does cover uh, the Harwood School Board and the Harwood Sports. The Valley Reporter is not one of our papers of record, um, and our only paper of record right now is the Free Press? Times Argus. Times Argus, sorry. Um, so there is that. Um, so my initial reaction was just concern, and I would like to know what everybody else on the board feels about it, and if they think that a community newspaper is a necessity. This is Mike. I'll kind of jump in. This is maybe a question for Lisa, but I pretty much think I know the answer. So I'm assuming that your paper is not going to do um, distribu distribution to all the folks in Waterbury the way it's done now. It would be some sort of a pay for paper kind of view or sport. I don't know if subscriptions or subscriptions online, how that would work. Yes. But I assume yes. it wouldn't be in free. Okay. Yes, we would revert to the model we had used for um, 15 or 20 years before the Waterbury record was created, where we have newsstand presence and we have subscriptions and we have, um, we have an e sub which is the actual PDF of the paper. We don't, personally, we don't actually right now have the resources to mail the paper to every house in Waterbury, but we are committed to covering the news of your town and providing newsstand presence in your town and also we're very willing and able to provide um, extensive online presence of your news, period. Okay, that's about where I thought it would be. Okay. We do intend to cover your select board, we do intend to cover your town, and we do intend to cover revitalized Waterbury, and we will, of course, continue our extensive coverage of Harwood and um, the Main Street Project, and your ongoing issues, including yours and Dexter. Would there, would there be a, a possibility of some uh, strategic places where there would be free papers available? Because there are a lot of people, you know, who are living paycheck to paycheck, so they're concerned, and, you know, I, I, I know you're not a nonprofit, and, you don't have to do this as a profit-making organization, but is there some, I know you probably would give, give some free things to the library, but other than that, would there be some free distribution or it would be all on, online and, and, and fee-based? So there are two different models for uh, how the U.S. Postal Service works. Some are free newspapers and some are subscription newspapers, so I don't even 
actually, no, I would have to get back to you on that. If our current newspaper bulk by which we mail the newspaper to our subscribers would allow for free distribution. So I will certainly look into that. I mean, we do have um, the ability to provide online PDFs of our entire paper. We do not actually have the ability, and I, I will research this, to provide free, with much like the library record did for 12 years. We don't have that ability because of our relationship with the post office. And it's right. just a certification that the newspapers get. This is, uh, this is Mark. Um, can you remind me, when you go on your, your website, is there a fee to look at the news, or is it available? Uh, there is no paywall. We do have, we don't put all our stuff up online, although in the last three weeks we have been putting pretty much everything online because this is such an unusual time. This is such a unusual situation to find ourselves in. We've been updating our website daily, probably three or four times a day. We've been tweeting links to our website. We've been um, writing Facebook updates. We are really, we've gone kind of 24 seven during this period because it is so unprecedented. And I honestly don't see us going back once we've taken this leap to being so three dimensional. You see, you don't think that you'll, you'll plan on doing any kind of paywall in the, uh, in the immediate future? No, I don't see a paywall coming. No, we could have a fairly expensive cost to create a paywall. Okay, thank you. So, Lisa, this is, this is Chris again. Um, to, to Mark's point here, um, like other small businesses, uh, radio stations and such, a lot of them have dropped their advertising under the circumstances, and I know that papers typically rely on those revenues in order to stay fiscally sound. Uh, moving forward, I can't imagine that uh, that uh, the Valley Reporter is unlike any other uh, media outlet that uh, they've got to have some form of revenue base. Um, have you seen a decline in, in ads and uh, by taking on Waterbury's kind of responsibility, um, that that's another, I won't call it burden, but it's another lift uh, on the paper's part and uh, it's, it's obviously not free to, uh, to cover the Waterbury area and report on it. So I'm just curious to know, um, moving forward, I know, I think you charge a dollar for the paper now. Is that going to be sufficient uh, moving forward? So, like every small community newspaper in Vermont, we are doing our best to continue to provide, provide our community members with coverage of important local information, period. Our paper is not a dollar, it is 75 cents. Okay. And, of course, we are heavily reliant on print advertisers, period. Like the community newspapers in Vermont, including the Waterbury Record, when all the businesses closed, we lost a bunch of print advertising. We have a very strong community support network, and we've begun to receive um, both donations and people publishing ads just for support for us because of the vital role that a community newspaper plays in how a town communicates with itself, right? Like, how are we possibly going to know what's going on in our town without a newspaper to communicate it? And when the Waterbury Record announced it was stopping publication, I was so saddened for you. And we will step up. We will do what we had done before. We will come. <coughs> and, and if we can't spit it over in print, we're going to spit it up in digital. We, we're going to make sure you don't become a news void. How do people know what's going on? Well, I appreciate that, and I wish you the best moving forward. Well, we're a community, you guys. We're all together. We're a fixed town community. We're not. We're not islands. We're not silos. Okay, Bill. Is there uh, are you for a motion here or anything? I don't think so. Yeah, one more, uh, Katie. Um, Lisa, can you just go over the space 
Um, you know, every week the space in the newspaper is dependent on how many ads are in the newspaper. So if you have a short week, you know, not all the stories are going to make it. And obviously it's called the Valley Reporter, so the Valley is going to get the first pick of the draw, correct? Sure, I'm happy to answer that, Katie. Thanks for that question. Um, it's called the Valley Reporter, and you are part of our community. We are, um, we are ad dependent based on print, so the number of print advertisements depend, determines the number of pages. And what we, the model we have recently adopted, since roughly March 5th or 6th, is that we're publishing stuff online and social media immediately, and then the print issue is following us. And we are committed to making sure that we are covering at least one story from Waterbury every week because you need, your, your community needs to know what's going on. So Katie's correct, the number of advertisements, advertisers determines the number of pages in the paper, which determines the news we can print, an issue which becomes the record, the recording of history of how our communities come through this very difficult time, which is why we want to include you. We, you need a record of how you guys are surviving, as well as the member of Valley Towns. I think that's it. I'm answering your question correctly, right, Katie? Yes, thank you. for reapproval re anyway. Um, I sent this out. Barb has worked on this plan to update it. Uh, there were a couple of other um, emails or documents that went along with it. So, Barb, are you still on the line? Yeah, I'm still here. Why don't you uh, just quickly walk us through what, what this is about and what we need to do? Disaster. 
Um, I don't think we have any right now. It's something that we have to talk with Bill about um, potential staffing for critical uh, actions like road culverts, things like that. So um, anyway, I'm pretty sure that you're allowable for repair funding and any other funding that might be built. The, there are some changes, and I'm not sure the copy that uh, I'm going to thank Carla for sending this out and bill to everybody. But on the actual document, um, on page 1-2, there were some updates that I just made today. And um, those updates had to do with, and I apologize, I Mark Fryer, I didn't realize you were the vice um, chair. So I added uh, your name and your contact information in there. And the Harwood Unified Union Supervisory District instead of the old uh, email address that they have. Other than that, everything is as you have received it. Um, the attachment packet that I think had gone out with it from either Bill or Carla, the last two pages of it. Bill or Carla, can you verify that they got the updated um, registered child care center? I sent out the package, the plan with the attachments last Friday, and Bill sent out, I think, the current version today. Um. Okay. No, I, I sent okay. it out. I sent it out Saturday. Oh. Um, I think that there might be some changes in the uh, in that uh, daycare thing that you suggested, Barb. Yeah, I think Carla sent it out properly. Okay. Did you send it out properly? I sent it out Friday. Okay. With the changes. The latest version you gave me. So yes. So I think yep, with all of that we would entertain um, approving it. There is a cover page that goes with it, two pages, <laughs> which goes to the regional planning commission and it needs to be approved by the select board and sometimes by Bill Shadluck and Chris Yen. And if you can't be here in person to sign them, uh, they will allow uh, a typed in signature. Uh, Assuming that you do approve it in the record, the uh, minutes record that. Yeah, we can uh, we can email it to Chris and he can sign it and then uh, send it back and then I can sign it. So I think we'll be all set there. Okay. okay. So I would like to make a motion then to uh, approve. Oh, well, I was going to get a motion a second first and then ask for questions. Okay. Okay, so if somebody would like to make a motion to approve the local emergency management plan for the town of Waterbury, Vermont for uh, April 6, 2020 for the ensuing year. This is Mike. I make a motion, a motion to approve the local emergency management plan uh, dated April 6, 2020 for the uh, next year. So we'd like to second that, please. Second. Any motion been made and seconded? Is there any further comments or questions? This, this is Mike. I do have a question. I was a little surprised reading this. I'm surprised that you know, at the beginning, under planners on 1.2, I'm surprised that a representative of the select board would not be on that stakeholder group. And I don't know if Bill can comment on that or Bar. We just uh, updated this, and there was not a series update on it. And um, as far as the planners go, the people, we've done a couple of exercises, and that helps define what was in our plan. But certainly next year, we'd be more than happy to uh, uh, have you on the committee, Mike. I'd be glad to. I have a lot of background in disaster planning with FEMA and stuff like that, and I'd be glad to do it, actually. Great. That'd be awesome. 
to the potential of using that as emergency, potential emergency funding for the businesses. And she thought at this time that there are other sources with um, SBA and Small Business Administration might be better fit for them. That sounded like Meals on Wheels may be able to take advantage of the, um, the, the FEMA one. Barb, Barb, this is Bill. Yeah. Um, FEMA money, um, are they, have they changed the rules? Pretty typically, FEMA money is only able to help uh, public entities. They typically don't right. do a lot with uh, private entities. Yeah, so what I just yeah, so discussed today, and I asked Carla to put it on the website, is for local municipalities that have state entity and the private nonprofit is the key word here. Okay. Or place called Meals on Wheels. Um, but for us, for the town, we can look at it from the angle of helping businesses that way too. All right. Okay, Bob. Uh, any other questions from board members? Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to start, uh, this is really just a, a conceptual discussion. It's not, I'm not going to ask for a motion tonight. Uh, I want to kind of take your temperature, so to speak. Uh, bad pun, I guess, with uh, what's going on with the COVID-19. But um, I'm, I'm just looking, I'm, I'm trying to think of things that, that we might be able to implement that could help uh, employees and potentially the town to a degree here. So I know this is a very complicated spreadsheet to look at. Um, I, I first thought about this about three or four weeks ago, right at the very beginning of this uh, episode, and wondered, you know, if we're going to have to uh, consider laying people off or p putting people on reduced hours, what would that mean? And I told you the first thing that I had suggested to my staff was that we were going to cut our time um, by, it was, it was 5% at, at that point. This is before uh, we got into the uh, stay-at-home order. So we were just planning on, everybody was planning on cutting back a little bit of time to try to conserve some resources. Um, but I thought everybody would be would be working that full 38 hours if, if we were talking about 40 hour people. Then the governor's stay at home order uh, came in place. Only essential services uh, were supposed to be actually working. So we instituted some layoffs and we've had to keep some staff on and we will have to continue to keep some staff on to do work that the municipality needs to do. And uh, as time is going forward, uh, you know, you might have employee X who uh, is working maybe, you know, three days a week and needs to do his or her job. And then, uh, you know, it makes it difficult to, do, do we consider that a, a layoff and force them to uh, sign up for unemployment? Or do they take uh, sick or vacation time to make up the difference in, in their hours? And at, initially, I was encouraging people to do that. Then as I started to look at the records that we have about the sick time that people have available, you know, I, I don't want to put people in a position where they end up using up all their sick time when they're not sick, they're just kind of staying at home for some time because they're ordered to, and, and we've got to reduce some hours. But um, 
it, it's difficult for those folks because they're not working like half time or anything like that uh, to file an unemployment claim. It's a process as any of you who have tried to file unemployment, unemployment claims or had employees do it, um, keeping some people out of the unemployment system seems like it might be a good way to go. So I just thought about, well, is there a way that people can uh, donate sick time into a bank that other employees might be able to, to use? And of course, uh, if you're going to ask people to donate or give up time, um, people who have not used a lot of sick time uh, and have kept it in case you know they had a you know a, a serious illness, and we've had employees who've had serious illnesses, they need an operation or what have you, and it's nice to have that sick time. So um, it's a combination of donate and sell, if you will. Uh, we do not pay out sick time at separation. So if you, if you resign from your job or you retire or if you get dismissed from your job, uh, if you had, you know, 100 hours of vacation time in your vacation bank, you'd get paid for your vacation time. But if you're like uh, me and you have, you know, 960 hours of sick time, you don't get anything for that. You just get thanked for not having used your sick time over the years. So um, what I've kind of done here is to say, well, you don't want people to donate sick time if they don't have a lot of it to begin with. So you can see, if you're looking at this spreadsheet, about the fourth or fifth column over, um, fifth column over, uh, Employee day is eligible. I'd, I'd like employees to have at least 40 days of sick time before they're even considered eligible for this. And the people who are highlighted in uh, different colors there uh, have more than, more than that time. And then the next column over shows how many days that they have to donate, how many days above 40 days do they have. And then as you move uh, to the right, it, it monetizes those hours at their pay rate. Now, I'll stop there for a second. Uh, our auditors, uh, we have a report in our accounting system, and our audit report shows every year what our on-the-book liability is if we had to pay sick time. So if everybody got sick all at once and everybody used all their sick time, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty... It's a pretty high number, and uh, I think right now it's $193,660 of sick time that the town carries as a liability on its books. So it's, as I said, it's typically unlikely that you're ever going to spend down that whole liability because we don't pay it out at separation. Um, so anyway, this concept would allow people to to, uh, to get paid for 20% of the sick time that they, that they gave up, that they were going to contribute to the bank. But that's capped at $2,500. That's in the brown column uh, over to the just right of middle. And, uh, you know, that if, if, and this spreadsheet assumes that everybody who has sick time enough to donate would do it. I've only talked to two employees about this. Um, one, frankly, was an EFOD employee. That was Bill Woodruff. And I, I had a very brief conversation with, with Carla today. So nobody even knows that this is being considered or even talked about. Um, but that, that brown column would show that if everybody donated or sold their highest amount available, it would cost the town $11,633, $630. And then um, the next column over shows the amount that would be available to donate into the bank. And then it shows you what people keep. And then over on the far right, it gets redistributed. So, this, this, this iteration, 
and as there's, there's an infinite number of ways to do this, this iteration does not just dump a whole bunch of hours into an unassigned bank that people can then just go in and, and uh, use up. It actually redistributes sick hours after this whole formula goes through and adds sick hours to employees' uh, banks. And it gives every employee, um, uh, even the ones who donate, it gets, even those people have some of their hours redistributed back to them. And then you can see over at the far right that, um, you know, it looks like there's more sick hours available after, re after redistribution than there are at the beginning. So if you go way over to the left, the second column in says accrued sick, hour sick hours, and you can see 7,047 at the bottom. If you go over to the far right, the second column from the right shows that after redistribution is 7,266. So it looks like the number of six hour, sick hours have actually gone up, and, and they have. But what's happening is you're redistributing hours uh, that have a high monetary value. For instance, you know, my, sick, my, my pay rate is much higher than anyone else's. So you're redistributing my hours back in amongst people with lower pay, so it causes the hours to go up. But you can see here that if you look at the third column from the right, after redistribution, the, uh, the total hours that the total value available to the employees is 170,497. Uh, and if you add that to the 11,630 that, that uh, would have been paid out to the donors, that equals 182,128 of value compared to the 193,660 on the books right now. So the town gets a little something out of this and then its liability if all the sick hours are used up goes away and then the employees who give up their sick time to allow other people to use it, uh, they get a little bit of cash uh, for, for selling some of their sick time and then the other employees have a lot more sick hours to, to use. And as we go forward, I'm just concerned that, you know, we have some people that have few sick hours because they just recently started their jobs. Uh, you know, Nick Nato has 80 hours of sick time right now. Karen Petrovich has uh, 139 hours. Michelle Ryan has not even 40 hours. Um, so those are people that are still working that we're counting on to continue to, to do their jobs. And if they should get sick in this situation, they could be in a position where they use up all their sick time and we wouldn't want that. So that's how this works. I'm gonna stop talking there because you know if this isn't anything that the board even wants to consider, then we'll, we'll, we'll stop. If it's something that you think is a, a concept that you might want to consider, we can talk about it, um, answer any questions that you have right now, uh, and we can come back to it later if we need to. This is Mike. Um, I know, Bill, we have kind of spoken about this issue before. As much as I'm a big believer in having some sort of way to share sick leave, I may be a little bit opposed to paying donors for that. I know we had a, a, a leave sharing kind of program, and it was more you were donating your annual leave that someone could use that for any purpose. Uh, but did it, and usually with someone who had cancer or some sort of debilitating uh, disease, you know, you know, none of us have seen anything like COVID, but I think people did it more out of the goodness of their heart. And I, I know what you're saying, Bill, is a lot of people won't do it unless there's something in it for them, but sometimes you're surprised. There's some people 
want to help their fellow employee. And that's my comment. I'll stick to it. That's a reasonable comment. Um, would you be more open to the discussion, uh, Mike, if if people were asked what they would do first? I mean, I, I'm interested in this. I think this is a good idea. I'm not... I mean, maybe if the percentage was lower, Mike, you'd be more agreeable to it, but I would definitely... Right. I'm interested in this discussion. It, it is, and, you know, I have always seen, you know, we typically... There were ways to donate to a, a kind of bank, but you could donate to a particular donor. And I know some people, hey, you knew some people who were not good about their sick leave for whatever reason, or the reason that they needed to leave was not as justified. I was less apt to donate. But, you know, anyone who I knew, you know, especially if I knew the individual at all, you know, because this was nationwide, uh, I was very glad to, to donate. And again, we weren't, re uh, you know, remunerated, and it was it was out of annual leave. And what they found too is that why why it was work because a lot of the people who were of more higher pay, if they had a certain amount that they had to use or lose, they were more apt to donate leave than. And people who were making less money usually had less time and less ability to weather a storm, kind of like where we are today. Yeah, and, and um, you know, to be clear, the, the personnel policy says that you're not supposed to use sick time unless you're sick. Now, uh, you know, when I started on this endeavor, Mike, I was kind of starting off the way that that you did, that, you know, we would, uh, we would simply donate time um, and put it into a, into a universal bank, if you will, and then let people right. take it. Um, but there has been some conversation, this was a couple weeks ago, but, you know, there are some people who are reluctant uh, to, to say, well, you know, gee whiz, you know, you've You've built up and earned that sick time. Uh, why, you know, why should I get to take it from you, uh, even if you're willing to give it? Um, so there's there's that element. Um, I also, in in this situation, I'm a little bit concerned. You know, if if we weren't talking about COVID-19, and somebody came along and had cancer or something like that, uh, sure. I mean. Me, for instance, if you look at my sick hours, I have 960 sick hours. That's as many as you can have. I have taken sick time in the past, uh, but you know I, I'm sick a couple days a year maybe, and I've been here long enough that you know I've got a lot of sick time. So if I, if I take three sick days this year, it takes me three months and then I'm back to what the maximum is. So I could right now, if I wanted to, say, okay, uh, every month that I accrue that, that adds nothing to my bank, put that in a, in a bank that anybody can choose from. I, I suppose, you know, there's a few of us that could do that. Um, I'm concerned that people with more modest, but with the ability, at least the way I look at it, to consider donating, um, unless they're going to get something for it, I'm not sure why they would do it. It's not, it's not such a situation right now that, that people have cancer or anything like that. We're just talking about this situation that we find ourselves in. So I'm, I'm not trying to convince you or change your mind, um, but from the, from the perspective of somebody who has a lot of sick time, and from the perspective of somebody who has to enforce the policy, it's a really hard policy to enforce. If, if a sick time comes up on, uh, you know, an employee's timesheet, uh, they've called their, their supervisor, or they've called me, and they say, I'm, I'm sick today, I'm going to take a sick day. Okay, you're sick today. Now, the policy says that you're not supposed to take sick time unless 
you're sick. But there's people on this list that have been employees for a long time, and they have little sick time. So from the perspective of somebody who has a lot, it's like, well, I think we've already been paying a lot of people to, to use their sick time. And for somebody who wants to donate uh, sick time, we won't you know, pay them 20% of the value of it. That, that sounds a little bit um, uh, counterintuitive, so. Understand. So Bill, obviously, this is Chris. Obviously, there's not a big piggy bank with all this um, money that backs the sick time uh, put away somewhere. This sick time about just gets paid for as it gets used, correct? Yeah. So the the budget the budget for every every department has a regular pay line in it, and that regular pay line, you know, for employees like uh, the people who work in the office here. Um, you know, you add up the number of hours in a year, which is 2,080 hours, that's 40 hours a week times 52 weeks, and you figure that people are either going to get regular pay, sick pay, or vacation pay, or holiday pay, and it doesn't matter what they take, that, that line item isn't any different. Um, so. The, there's enough money in the budget to pay everybody to work the prescribed hours that we expect they're going to work. And, you know, there are some people in the highway department, it's a little bit of an estimating job because we never know how many hours of overtime they're going to have in any particular year. But for most of the other employees, if, if the line item is $75,000, it's pretty likely that it's going to be within you know, a thousand bucks or so of, of that 75,000 because almost nobody except the highway personnel works overtime. So there's no piggy bank out there, Chris, with $193,000 in it. And uh, if, if everybody took all their sick time, um, you know, it's 7,000 hours of sick time for uh, 25 people. And 25 times uh, 40 hours is going to be way more than 7,000 hours. So there's money in the budget that it's not a it's not a problem for the budget. Let's put it that way. Hey Bill, I see that you have a cap at 2,500 hours. Did you say if that was going to be limited to a per year, or is that lifetime of an employee in terms of how many times? They could bank and then sell hours in your No, I, I'm, I'm looking at this as kind of a one-time deal, Mark, that, you know, I, I don't anticipate this kind of going on and on and on forever. It's just a, a matter of kind of redistributing what's on the books now. That was my thought, anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, for me, I mean, if we're... I think we, we talk a lot about, you know, what, what are the real numbers and what's the, the ultimate impact. If, if the ultimate impact in this scenario, is from when I'm quickly reading, unfortunately, on my phone, is 11,600 or whatever the number is, um, to potentially make more of an opportunity for someone who's sick to get the pay they might need to weather, you know, being ill. I mean, for me personally, I can make that decision pretty quickly and say I'm kind of support of this. Um, you know, I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily be in support if it was an annual thing that, that all of a sudden it could become compensation for someone and be a formal compensation. But if it's, if it's more of a one-time thing to help someone who's sick and it's not a big number and it's really going to affect their budget much, I, I think I can be in support of it. Yeah. Can I make a comment? I agree with you, Mark. I, this is Mike. I agree with you too, Mark. That's, that's the as much as sometimes philosophically I may have a little bit of a problem, if we're looking at a hit of $11,000, I don't see this being a problem. But maybe I'll address one thing to Bill. Are we going to allow people down, down the road if, like, if we don't have enough hours for them to work, you know, and not sick with COVID or something else, will they be able to their sick leave toward, you know, to avoid, you know, putting them on unemployment? 
I think your memo before kind of alluded to that. Yeah, so, so, um, it's crossing the line. I think this, I think as far as the COVID is concerned, this may help a couple of people. So, you know, let's say again, employee X um, is, is doing an essential job and they're working, you know, uh, 33 hours doing stuff that they have to do. I can envision that employee using five hours of sick time to get up to the 38 hours that we're kind of asking everybody to at least, you know, to have that 5% reduction in their paid time. So I could see somebody like that using it to bridge a, a narrow gap as opposed to try to go through the process and claim unemployment for five or 10 hours a week. Um, for the people who are laid off or the people like the highway department right now that are, that are on half time now, uh, they're not gonna use this so they can stay up to you know, 38 or 40 hours. Uh, they might use this if they get sick in, in their 20 hour work week and they get sick they might use eight hours of sick time to, to pay them, you know, get them up to 20. But it's not meant to get people who are working half time up to 40, Mike. books just you know goes down a little bit uh, with, you know people the people who donate and get paid compensated for that will will get get some cash out of it um, I'm suggesting that maybe um, we just talk about this tonight everybody who's in a situation of uh, being laid off has one more week to go in terms of um, you know, in lieu of in lieu of notice, so they're getting paid. So uh, I'd like what I'd like to do is be able to to run this by the EFUD commissioners because again, I know you know we're two separate municipalities, but from the perspective of the employees, we're kind of all we all feel like we're one organization, and if if one entity, the town does it and then EFUD doesn't do it, that's a little problematic. I mean, at least I'd like to know going in. So uh, from my perspective, I'm not looking for a motion tonight, Chris. Um, the EFUD commissioners are meeting on Wednesday, and then uh, your next meeting is on the 20th, and I think we should meet on the 20th. Uh, I'll have a, a budget report to review at that time and then we can uh, come back to this, and if we think it's a good idea, we can implement it then. Okay. Does that work for uh, everybody? Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, any other board members have any comments? So you said that you asked how many people out there are in favor of this so far? I've only talked to two people. Okay. One town employee and one e employee. Okay, so are you looking to get more feedback from others? Can you speak louder, Kate, here? I was just asking Bill how many people he's talked to so far about it and if he's planning, if we want to discuss this at a further uh, at another meeting, if he would reach out and get other people's opinions uh, that this would affect. Yeah, I might do that. Um, I want to talk to the EFUD commissioners first and then have, have their comments, just like I had, had yours. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm leaning towards more having the boards decide to do it as opposed to asking the employees. If the employees don't want to participate, then it just dries up on the vine and, and we, don't, we don't move forward. I really don't want to get into 
talking to 30 people and getting 30 different, well, could you do this or could you do that instead? So, um, so far I've kept it very narrow in terms of who I've talked to. This is, uh, this is Mark. I mean, I, yeah, I agree. The one concern I have there is as soon as someone thinks that they might be able to get the percentage up to increase compensation versus something I feel like we're making a decision as a board on just, you know, to throw a little bit of money, I, I would just be afraid of when all of a sudden everyone starts screaming, well, I want 100% or right. whatever. And, 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 and you know, like we're trying to do something to help. I agree, Mark. And you know, when I when I pick the twenty percent, um, I pick the twenty percent because you know I wanted to make it attractive enough to some people who are at even at the lower end of the pay scale. But that's why I capped it at at twenty five hundred because I also don't want it to be something where. You know, the employees say, oh, gee whiz, look at that, you know, uh, he got $10,000 out of this. I, I, don't, I don't want that to be the case. So, you know, it's 20% to make it valuable enough for some people to say, yeah, I'll do it, but I don't want it to be a, you know, a big windfall for anybody else in keeping with what Mike had said. Okay. Bill, one quick question before we end on this. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of the employees, how many would really be in favor of this? Um, I, I really don't. You know, the, I, I think that, I think if you look at this sheet and you see the, the fairly small number of people that are able to donate and the fact that everybody in the organization will get more sick time. I, I, think, I think it's, you know, the people who have no skin in the game, no ability to really donate, I think they'll be happy to, to get more sick time added to their banks, whether they need it through this crisis or they'll just have it going forward. But um, uh, I, I think people will be interested in it, Mike. Okay, uh, late this afternoon I sent out a memo that Nick Nadu had prepared for me. Did everybody get it? Yeah, I got it. Yes, I yes. Okay, yes. good. All right, so I, I don't have to read through it. Um, last week my inclination was, you know, we were getting, we were getting comments from people, some asking facilities to be closed, others, you know, telling us that it was great that, that facilities were open. But after the governor's order uh, and kind of the follow-ups about uh, really social distancing, you know, last week uh, getting the word that, you know, when you're in public in places like uh, stores and the like, when you have to go in there, that they're recommending masks be worn. Uh, we started to get some pretty amped up people who were concerned about facilities being open. So I ordered Nick last week to close everything. Um, he had already closed the playground facilities. Uh, the tennis court and the basketball courts were open. Um, we started getting reports that, that in the tennis courts, uh, the first week or so that we put the nets up, it was pretty much people, you know, a uh, father and a son were playing tennis and stuff like that. Well, by the middle of last week, there were, you know, crowds of unrelated people that were gathering there, you know, 10, 12 at a time. So uh, we ended up locking the facility. Um, we've had a couple of comments from folks by email who are not happy about this. Um, I told Nick to close everything, and if the select board wanted to reverse my decision, that they could do that. 
I'm not recommending that you do that. It's seemingly that as time goes on, more and more of the information that we're getting is positive about this. Um, it's too bad that we have to do it, but, but I think it's the right thing. Um, we have to be creative about how we close the skateboard facility up in Waterbury Center. Um, we put tape up around there and, you know, the free spirits that are skateboarders have pretty quickly decided that didn't apply to them. <laughs> so we're going to do something um, to make it physically impossible to use it. Katie's got her hand up. I would just add to that point that even though that the skate park is closed now, when the state police patrol the Waterbury Center, they're always, or most of the time that I see, um, they're behind the fire station anyway, so they could just, they're already there. Yeah, the, the police you mean? Yeah, the state police, they park behind the fire station. Yeah, the police, the police are there. I did send an email to Lieutenant White the other day and just asked him to make sure that, you know, that his uh, troopers that are doing patrols in Waterbury understand that our facilities are all closed. And I told him that I wasn't asking them to babysit anybody or to, you know, to stand guard at the facilities. But if they saw anything being used, that they, uh, that they would uh, take note of it and, and ask the people to disperse. So that's, that's kind of where we are with the facilities right now. Um, the dog park is really an EFUD facility, but that will be closed as well if it hasn't been already, I think. Um, and then you can see from Nick's uh, memo here that, you know, some things that we had already advertised and taken in cash for, like spring swim lessons, uh, some of the uh, spring programming for adults, the April vacation break camp. Uh, we've had to cancel those. We're in the process of refunding money to those people now. Um, we are still working to hire a summer recreation program staff and a staff of lifeguard people. Um, it's a little bit challenging. I don't know what else folks are going to find uh, out there in the same uh, kind of categories, but you know, College kids are looking for a job, and if you tell them that you don't know, they're you know they're going to continue to look until they have something more solid. So we're still trying to plan as if we're going to be open. Um, I think there's some degree of likelihood. I I don't have a percentage, uh, but it's possible that you know that this could even extend into the summer. And if that happens, we obviously won't be able to have a camp. Uh, fortunately, our budgets are built such that if we don't have the camp, we don't have the staff, and therefore we don't need the revenue to pay the bills. So, um, you know, I think we'll end up a little bit on the losing end if we don't have ourselves the ability to do anything, uh, except in the pool, that will be a, that will be a, positive for the budget because we never take in enough money to pay for all the pool expenses. So anyway, I'll stop there unless you and see if you have questions or concerns. You're talking about yeah. in, the, in the rec facilities or what? No, I mean just average downtown. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a ghost town, but it's not busy, that's for sure. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot less traffic. Um, Mark, uh, how are things going on your end? How are things going what? On your end, are you doing any uh, uh, take out or anything like that? No, we're not. Um, we're conserving cash and just hoping for us to end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there is there is one recommendation on this memo. It's on the first side, down at the bottom. 
So there's a big, there's a continuing push from people who want to sign up for the community gardens that we allow that to happen. Um, you know, there's a small expense for us to do that. Uh, we have to pay somebody to, to rototill the plots. We already have a lease with Green Mountain Power. We have to pay that lease uh, uh, anyway because the lease is still in place. But uh, Nick is recommending that we increase fees for the community gardens from $15 a plot to $25, and that would be for a single plot. And a, a double plot would increase from $20 to $35. This is not really a COVID-19 issue. What he says here is these increases bring us closer to that, what other towns charge. Some towns charge significantly more than we do. Uh, and, you know, over time, we, we look at all of our fees, but uh, these, if we're going to do the community gardens, uh, he thinks we should increase the fees to, uh, to uh, 25 and 35, respectively, for single and double plots. So that would need a motion. Yeah, it seems like a tough time to be doing that, but. Bill, this is Mike. I, I assume that the community So the, the the tennis courts are locked now, Mike. So they can't they can't get okay. in. There. And I did I did ask people. about I did ask about taking the. I'm a the, youngster too. I had to jump over fences. <laughs> go ahead. Somebody else had something. Yeah, Bill. This is Mark. Um, how many plots are, are do we have? How many what? Garden plots. Um, Garden yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of 40? my head, Mark. I want to say almost like forty. Forty, maybe. Yeah, I think to echo Chris's point, you know, I, I have big concerns about uh, food scarcity and the availability of food, and I really don't think that it's a big number to to make any kind of increase in the fee. That's fine. This uh, year, uh, uh, that that would be my quick feedback on that. That's okay. Do it next year. Okay. Okay, people, unless there's any other big items or questions or comments, we can call it a night again. Okay, so we we'll uh, I know we we're, were maybe leaving something at the end, Mrs. Mark, uh, about whether or not we make a recommendation to the school board. I could not oh, find that letter in my email. It's too late. The only thing I could find was within uh, Caitlin email his his request to be included in the discussion. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think that was it, Mark. You're right. Um, she okay. didn't didn't she kind of uh, mm -hmm. his whole email text to her is there, right? He he kind of gives his what he thinks his qualifications are for the job, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the one I'm talking about. So it wasn't from him, it was from Caitlin. Uh, there's an email from Scott on March 25th, and you are CC'd on it. I can forward it to you if you'd like. Yeah, you could. Sometimes they screw up my email. Yeah, I was just looking for it. I remember seeing it, but I don't... It, it was there. Katie, if you could just forward yep. that on so it's easy access for all of us. Yep. Anything else? No. Yeah, I think so. Basically, we have to make a decision that we're not going to make a recommendation as a board 
I mean, there are two people. Um, I really do appreciate that uh, Michael King has reached out and also attended the meeting this evening. Um, but I, I feel a little, I just don't feel like I have enough to make a full recommendation of the board for a specific individual. Yeah, I think that's the consensus, Mark. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at, too. Yeah, I mean, it's really unfortunate that he didn't want to participate today. I would think he would want to. That kind of swayed my decision a little bit. Well, you know, Scott Calder, like I do, he's, uh, he's a working fool, and he's usually uh, up to his eyeballs doing something. Okay, that's good to know. So that's probably why he didn't attend. Yeah, I... I, I... Personally, I plan on uh, attending the meeting on Wednesday night. Um, in however, <laughs> whatever fashion I can attend it in. Um, so I, I, I don't think I would be inclined to make a <clears throat> decision tonight. Okay. I agree. So. Uh... We'll, we'll plan another one of these for the 20th of April. All right? Okay. Did you say that was good? Did you say um, the 20th, Bill? Yes. So normal schedule unless, unless we need something in the interim. Right. You going to be on vacation that week, Matt? No, that's my birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stay at home water. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, if there's nothing else, then we can adjourn if somebody wants to make a motion. I make the motion to adjourn. Somebody like to second that? I'll second that. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to adjourn. Uh, all you people stay safe, stay uh, well, and uh, maybe we can get together soon. Okay. Good night. 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 Good night.